Okay, time for some physics. Let's do this. So, let's start off with the first page you're going to come across is your formula sheet. Now, this is a blessing because you don't need to memorize any of these. You do have a need to memorize the units. So, wave speed is measured in ms. Physics is usually meters. Frequency is measured in hertz. Wavelength in meters. Wave speed, meters per second. Distance, meters, time, seconds. Power is in watts. Current is in amps. Voltage, potential difference, is in voltage. Potential difference and voltage mean the same thing. Now, however, you've been shown how to work out wave speed, but you haven't been shown how to work out frequency. So how would you do that? If they gave you a question where they said to work out how do you work out frequency and they're giving you these two numbers. Now, learn how to put any of these into a triangle. Really, really straightforward. If I'm times in those two, they must go at the bottom. And then V goes at the top. This one here. Now, I'm not times in the bottom two. The X goes at the top. X, V, times T. This one here. Do it over here. Times in the bottom two, so they go at the bottom. And the last one here, because E is the top, E is in the top of the triangle as well. E, P times T. So, how are these useful? Well, whatever you want to work out, you cover up. So, if I wanted to work out frequency, I cover it up, and it's V, wave speed, divided by wavelength. And you must divide top by bottom, not the other way around. So, if I want to work out V, F times wavelength. So, do another one here. If I want to work out I, I is P divided by V. So all you got to do is literally, with your finger, actually literally just cover it up. And if you want to write these out at the beginning of the exam, why not? Yeah, but they're really easy to turn in the triangle. Those two are the same. The bottom ones, those ones go at the bottom. Whilst for these two, X goes at the top, E goes at the top. These two, you're unlikely you'll need to really rearrange. I'll show you a different sort of technique to deal with them. So they are the triangles. So let's try one massy question together. A man monitors how much money he spends on electricity. He uses a device which calculates the cost of electrical energy used. He connects his 2.9 kilowatt electric kettle to the 230 volt main supply. So I've got power, I've got voltage, and I've been asked to work out current. Power, voltage, current. And just like I'm doing, underline in the exam. And if you want to, write down each thing you've been given. I've been given power, which is 2.9 kilowatts. I've been given voltage, which is 230 volts. And I've been asked to work out current, which has symbol I. We don't need to learn symbol, because it's at the front. So power, current, and voltage. Let's go back. Power, current, voltage. How do you work it out? P equals I times V. So what I'm going to do is, again, mine disappeared now, but yours would have stayed there. So make sure you do the underlining. It does help. P, I, V. So my power is 2.9 kilowatts. My voltage is 230 volts. And I've been asked to work out this one. You get numbers for just putting them in, even if you don't rearrange the equation. Yeah, but I know how to put that into a triangle. P goes to the top, I, V. Yeah, so how do you work out current? Cover it up, P divided by V. However, you've got a problem. This is why this is worth three marks. Is it's kilowatts. Yeah, any time you see a killer, a K, that usually means a thousand. So that I want that in watts. 2.9 kilowatts, how do I turn that into watts? Well, all you do is 2.9 times a thousand is two thousand nine hundred there are a thousand watts in one kilowatt if that was one kilowatt it'd be a thousand watts if that's two kilowatts it'd be two thousand watts i've got 2.9 so the answer is two thousand nine hundred watts now it's easy power two thousand nine hundred and my voltage is fine because that's just in volts 230 you divide those two again you are given a calculator makes your life really easy 2900 divided by 230 
And I get it on these calculators when it comes out as a fraction. To change it, there. Answer is 12.6086. Really long number. Now, just because it's a long number does not mean it is wrong. Yeah, just round it up or just do to one decimal place. I'm going to keep it as just 12.6. 12.6. You probably also get the mark for writing it as 13. But usually they're not very specific about this, so it's up to you. But just because it's got loads of decimal places doesn't mean it's wrong. So here's the mark scheme. They give it, they, you, get, you get the mark from 13. But again, you'll still get the mark if you give it 12.6. Okay, using standard form. Now, this is more geared towards higher people. If you're foundation, you probably won't get it in standard form. However, there's no harm in looking because I'm pretty sure there'll be some sort of standard form in your mass paper. Okay, the telescope collects light reflected from Jupiter. The frequency is 4.3 times 10 to the 14. I've got a frequency. I've also been given a speed and I've been asked to work out the wavelength. So wavelength, frequency, speed. Go to my formula sheet. Wavelength, frequency, speed. So V. Let's write this down. V, F. Yeah? That's the formula. Let's put in the numbers. So my frequency is... Frequency is 4.3 times 10 to the 14. My wavelength, I haven't got. That's what I've been asked to work out. I've been given my wave speed. And my wave speed is 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Okay, I've been asked to work out this one. So that's an issue there, yeah? So how do you go about doing that? Let's put that into a triangle. V, the two ones you times at the bottom. Yep, I've been work out, asked to work out this one. How do you work it out? It's wave speed. So 3.0 times 10 to the 8 divided by the frequency, which is 4.3 times 10 to the 14. Okay, now these numbers. First thing, actually, I haven't mentioned is that's in hertz, that's in meters per second. Don't need to change anything. Now, what does it mean when it says times 10 to the 8? What does it mean when it says times 10 to the 14? That just means that I'm moving this decimal place 8 times. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that is 3 with 8 zeros. I'm moving this one 14 places along. Why do they use it? Why do they write it like this? Why? Why do that? It's just because it makes it much more simpler to write on a piece of paper. And think about it. If you're writing down 14 or 13 zeros, it's quite easy to miss one. You don't need to write that down or put that into a calculator with eight zeros. You can put it directly into this. So what do you do? Four, so the first one is, so my answer is three times 10 to the eight. So three, and it's bottom of the bottom here, that one there, times 10 to the X. Comes out like that, and then eight. Now, I'll show you what that equals. What does it equal? That equals three with eight zeros. So now let's work the whole thing out. 3 to the power of 14. Sorry, not 14. 3 to the power of 8 divided by 4.3. Same again. 14 equals, and I get it as a fraction, but you know how to change that. Press the SD button. There you go. So my answer is... 0.0000000000, how many zeros is it, sorry, 0.0000069, yeah, and I know, you're probably thinking, that's really weird, look at that number, just because it looks strange, that does not mean it is wrong, yeah, you go with the answer you've been given, so my answer is 0.00000, .00 how many zeros have I got? One, two, three, four. This is why standard form is a lot easier. One, two, three, four, five, six. There. No point. Zero, 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 six meters. There's your answer there. Did I get this right? I did get it right. They give it you in standard form. 
Yeah. So if your calculator came out in standard form, so mine's come out as like a full number like that. If it came out in standard form, you could write it down in standard form. You don't need to change it into the full number like this. If the answer is in standard form, you keep it in standard form. Okay, last thing I want to do is on the transformer calculations. Again, this is only for higher. So for foundation people, I wouldn't worry about this at all. But for higher people, 100%, there'll be one of these come up. So I've got a transformer calculation. A transformer has 2,400 turns on the primary coil and 100 turns on the secondary coil. Calculate the secondary voltage if the um, primary voltage is... You just messed it up. Just go with it, Mr. Soon, come on! No, I don't want you in here. Go away. Sorry. Okay, transformer calculations again. So, now this is actually only to do with higher people, so foundation people. Do not worry about this. They're not going to ask you this. Okay. A transformer has 2,400 turns in the primary coil, coil and 100 turns in the secondary coil. Calculate the secondary voltage. So, now let's have a look back at our formula sheet. This equation I'm interested in. VP, VS, NP, NS. Voltage in the primary, voltage in the secondary, number of turns in the primary, number of turns in the secondary. So let's write this down first. VP, VS, NP, NS. Now, again, you could get a question where it gets a little bit more complicated. So, there's no harm in understanding what a transformer does. But to be fair, you need to know what it does, but to understand it a little bit more. Now, a transformer either increases the voltage or decreases the voltage. So, if I have to draw this transformer, it looks something like this. Yeah? A transformer has 2,400 turns on the primary coil. So, this is the primary coil. It has 2,400. Obviously, I'm not going to draw 2,400. And 100 turns on the secondary coil. So on the secondary coil, it has only 100. So it's not going to be anywhere as much as, as much. The secondary voltage, calculate the secondary voltage, the primary voltage is 12. So 12 volts goes in. Now they're basically asking you, what is the voltage that goes out? Now, something to remember is, is if the secondary turns are less, then this is a step down. It's taking the voltage down. So the answer should be less, but let's give it a go. So, on the primary one is 2,400 turns. Yeah, so we can write that down. 2,400. On the 100 turns on the secondary. And it's asking you, it's giving you the primary voltage. Is 12. Now, how do I work out this one here? Well, basically, it's a ratio. So they are, let me grab a calculator, they're the same. So, basically, I want to know how many times smaller 100 is from 2400. Because this number will be also that many times smaller. So, what do you do? You do 2400 divided by 100, which you should probably be able to do in your head, is 24. 2,400 divided by 100 is 24. So that is 24 times smaller. So that one must also be 24 times smaller. So how do you do that? You do 12 divided by 24, and the answer is 0 0.5. So the secondary voltage is 0 0.5. Easy peasy. Energy. Now, why should you care about energy? Well, you should care because energy is what makes everything happen. This is a um, key definition you need to learn. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred. This is known as the conservation of energy. And then finally, it dissipates into the surroundings. Now, what does that mean? So imagine you have a candle. There's my flame on my candle, yeah? Terrible drawing, I know, but who cares? Um, there's my candle flame. Now, what's happening here is you're burning the candle. A candle is an energy store, and it's a chemical energy store. So there's chemical energy stored in that candle. You are then using that energy to create light and heat. So light is given off, so is heat. Now, that energy, that arrow should be that way, that energy is not lost, 
it just goes into the surrounding it is dissipated light goes out so does the heat another example one they always ask you one one they always ask you but the one you need to which you always get as an example is a light bulb now a light bulb gives off you put in electrical energy put in electrical and what do you give out light and heat now again, none of that energy is lost, it just goes into the surroundings. Okay, another thing, you get, you come across a fancy word, fancy word called efficiency. That just means how good a machine is. So this light bulb, what energy do you want from this light bulb? You want light. That's the energy you want from the light bulb. What don't you want is heat. So the more light you get from it, the more efficient it is. So we could try it, for example. So if I put in a thousand joules, Joules is the unit for energy into this light bulb. And let's say um, 750 joules of that was light and then 250 joules of that was heat. And how do I know that if that was 750, that has to be 250? Because the whole amount was 1,000. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't disappear. It just gets transferred. This light bulb gives off that much light energy and that much heat energy. What you want is light. Yeah, so how efficient is this light bulb? Well, it's pretty decent because it gives off a lot more energy and light than it does in heat. And you can actually work this out, which we'll have a go at doing later, but this one, you can kind of do in your head. This light bulb is 75% efficient. So that means that out of the energy that goes in, 75% is useful. Okay, now here are some of the energy types you need to learn. Electrical, light, sound, thermal, another word for heat. Gravitational potential energy. Now, that one sounds complicated, but actually, all gravitational potential energy means, so like, if I had, if I, if you got a plane, for example, no, yeah, let's do a plane. If you got a plane, that plane, if it's in the air, has a GPE, because it's high up in the air. It has gravitational potential energy. Anything that's high up has gravitational potential energy. So the, so the closer it gets to coming to the ground and landing, the less GPE it has. Really, really simple. Chemical energy is another one people get confused. This is stuff that you find in food and in batteries. Kinetic energy is movement. And elastic is when you stretch things. So the more you stretch it, the more elastic energy it has. Okay. Now, let's have a look at how we can use energy. Now, how do we use energy? We don't make it. We can transfer it. So this is an example. And you get... Again, you might get asked this. So, if we've got coal that arrives at a power station, now every power station works in the exact same way. They all do the same thing, be it coal, oil, or nuclear, does the same thing. In that you burn it, well in nuclear you don't burn it, you give off energy, but let's say coal and oil for the moment. You burn the coal, the coal, the coal heats up water, water turns to steam. So if you imagine, I've got chemical energy there, haven't I, in my coal. That chemical energy is used to heat up water. So the chemical energy turns to heat. Yeah? That heat energy is then um, creates steam, and the steam moves along, and the steam moves turbines. So steam moves turbines. Movement is called kinetic. <coughs> Bless me. And then the kinetic energy is then used to also move a generator, so the kinetic energy continues, and then you end up with electrical energy. <coughs> Bless me again. Now, so what does this tell you? Is that, have you made electricity? No. You've just transferred it from chemical to heat to kinetic, and then finally to electrical. That's the basis of all power stations. Nuclear power, however, does something similar, but instead of burning it, you basically... You split atoms in a way, and you um, the heat energy given off boils water, turns steam, turbines, and so on. Yeah, but for the moment, we have an idea of the fact that energy is transferred. Okay, let's try an example here. A train is powered by a diesel engine. A diesel energy engine is used to turn a generator. The generator provides electricity for electrical motors. We'll have a look at how generators work later. Now, it says, draw one straight line from each train part to the useful energy transfer. Okay, now what's the goal of a diesel engine? In the engine, you put fuel. So you put in chemical in. 
that chemical energy turns a generator. So it must be chemical to kinetic. Yeah? Now what does the generator do? The generator turns. So you've got kinetic energy turning into electrical energy. And then finally, what does your motors do? Your motors turn the electrical energy into kinetic energy, which makes you move. Yeah? So you've just got to just think about the scenario. But all you're doing is you're changing from one energy transfer to the other. State one example of non-useful energy transfer in this motor. So one way, in the motor, so this step out here, in which you get non-useful energy transfer. What do you want from the motor? You want the motor to turn the wheels. What other types of energy is going to be given off? Heat could be one. Sound could be another. Yeah, in general, a lot of the time, heat's going to be the one that is the wasted one, the majority of the time. No machine, well, not many machines, give off zero heat. Even your phone, when you charge it up, gives off heat. You don't want the heat, but it gives it off. That is a, that is wasted energy. Okay. The table... Give some data about the, about the small petrol engine. Not including the other question, doesn't matter. Energy transfer to the surroundings in each second. So that's how much energy is transferred to the surroundings. 5,200. Energy supplied to the dynamo in each second. 2,800. So it's basically a, a little machine, and what you want it to do is you want it to um, go to the dynamo so it changes it around. Calculate the total energy supplied to the petrol energy in, in each second. Now, the total, en the total energy is easy, because what do you do? Just add the two numbers up. That's how much you put in all together. Now, calculate the efficiency of the machine. Well, energy transfer to the surroundings, you don't want any engine to give off energy to the surroundings. That will be heat and sound, won't it? Heat and sound. That's not the useful one. How do you calculate efficiency? This is in your formula sheet. But to, I'll show you how you work it out. It is useful divided by total times 100. So what's my useful energy? The useful is this one, 2,800. What's my total? 8,000. Now the mistake people make is, is that we do 2,800 divided by 5,200. That's not the total. And then times by 100. Let's give it a go. So we've got 2,800, which is my useful energy, divided by the total, which is 8,000. And then I then times that by 100, 35% efficient. So this machine is 35% efficient. Yep, answer there as well, 35% efficient. Okay, now, you might get asked to interpret one of these. Now, they look difficult, but actually it's really easy. They're called Sankey diagrams, but you won't be asked to draw one or name it. You might be asked to interpret it. So for this, um, we've got a student produces a diagram to show energy changes in a lamp. Okay, so that's the amount of energy that goes into the lamp. 200 joules, yeah? 60 joules of it is light. So how much is heat? Well, we know energy can't be destroyed, yeah? So it's going to still be there. So if my overall is 200, 60 of it is light. How much of it's going to be heat? We can work it out. You can do it in your head, but I'll just show you. 200, take away 60. Answer is 140. Now, how do we calculate efficiency? What do you want from a lamp? Light. So you do useful divided by total times 100. So 60 divided by 200 times 100, 30% efficient. That's how good of a lamp it is, yeah? And it makes sense, because you think about it, that number's 30%. That means only 30% of the energy is used as light. That makes sense, because there's loads of it's given off as heat. So the number fits, yeah? That's energy. Let's try a, another one. Now, this is interesting. The graph shows... Okay, the roller is lowered and the pirate boat swings freely. So we've got a pirate boat going up and down. The graph shows how the height reached by the pirate boat changes with time. Okay, so on this side I've got the, the height and this is the time. Complete the sentence by putting an X in the box next to your answer. The pirate boat will have the most, the maximum kinetic energy at one point. 
This is only a multiple choice question, but it's actually quite difficult. Now here, at A, what type of energy does a pirate boat have? GPE, gravitational potential energy. Here, the GPE turns into kinetic energy. So it gets faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. The fastest point is at the bottom. That's the fastest possible point. So that's where it has the most kinetic energy. Then the kinetic energy is changed into GPE. Same again. Now the reason why it's not this one is, is because you can tell the graph's lower. It slowly starts to slow down. Yeah. So it has the most, GP, the most kinetic energy there. Okay, induced current. What does it mean? Let me show you something first. I'm going to steal a little video. Take a magnet, coil a wire. Now, before he does that, this is a coil of wire. That's a, called a galvanometer. It's just a fancy word for an ammeter that's really sensitive. Now, when he, when the magnet is moved, you'll see. Now, that's these wires are connected to no power pack. It's just a wire and an ammeter. So, in your circuit, I've got no power pack there. I've got no battery there. And look what happens when you take a magnet in between. The, you actually generate a very small current in the wire. Carry on. Yep, it'll show you a bit closer what happens. So you get a current reading. Now there's something else that's important as well. Is that when you move it in a particular direction, the current will go in a certain direction. So what do you think will happen when the magnet when the magnet is moved in the other direction? It goes the other way. That's called an induced current. And now this principle changed the world. This is how we generate electricity. By either moving a magnet or moving a coil of wire. It can be either one. But you need two things. You need a coil of wire and you need a magnet. Yeah, you don't need to know how that works. You just need to know... Well, you don't need to know why it works. You need to know just how it works and how the steps involved. Now, that's called an induced current. Okay, now you need to know in your exam, how can you increase the size of an induced current? So how can I make that current stronger? Well, you could have more turns in your wire. So just like in the, in the video, if you had more turns, you'd have a stronger current. Use an iron core. You could have put an iron core in between, would have also given you a stronger current. And use a stronger magnet. Well, and one more, sorry. Move the wire faster. So the faster you move it, the greater the current. Like in that diagram, it shows the magnet moving, but it could have been either one. Now, what affects the direction of the current is the direction of the movement of the wire or the direction of the movement of the magnet. So as you saw, when the magnet went in, the current went in one direction. When I moved it out, when the video moved it out, the current went in the other direction. So learn how to increase the size of an induced current. Now, why is this important? Because it's all to do with generating electricity. And we do this in power stations. And if you go back to the earlier bit I showed, I talked to you about um, how a power station works, this links to how a power station works because a power station turns a generator. So I'll show you a picture. How does a generator work? You have a magnet, you have a wire in between, and basically the wire in between will move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as it does that, you generate a current in the wire. That's, again, an induced current. The other example of an induced current you need to learn is a dynamo. Now, dynamos are found in, like, on bikes for automatic headlights. Automatic headlights, headlights that work without any batteries. So as you're pedaling, what's happening is the magnet's spinning. Now, this time, the actual magnet's moving. In a generator, the wire's moving. But do you see, what's the general thing you need to remember? Is you've got cores of wire, you've got a magnet. And if you move either of them, you generate a current. And how can you make your current stronger? Is by having a stronger magnet, having an iron core, more turns, and moving it faster. That's an induced current. Sounds hard, but actually is not that difficult. Now, let's have a look at this to get together. This is a six mark question. The diagram shows a model used to generate electricity from water waves in a tank. Okay. The ball floats on the surface of the water, so that's the ball. A coil of wire is fixed to the floor of the tank and a magnet is suspended from the ball inside the coil. So you've got a magnet and you've got a coil of wire. When a wave is sent along the surface of the water, the ball moves up and down. So as the wave goes, the ball moves up and down. Now think about it. What does the ball do as it moves up and down? The magnet, it moves the magnet in between the wire. So what am I going to generate in that wire? A current. Now here's the graph. 
shows you what happens. It shows you the current over the time. So you see the current goes positive and negative and positive and negative. Why? Because the magnet goes in, it goes out, in and out. It's just changing the direction constantly. Explain how this current is induced in the coil in the model. You should refer to the model and the label points on your graph to your answer. Now think, what's the simplest way of explaining this? Is the ball moves up and down. As the ball moves up and down, it moves the magnet. As the magnet moves, it induces a current in the wire. Now why does the current change direction? It's because the magnet is moving up and down, up and down. I'll show you the mark scheme. A current is induced when the relative movement between the magnet and the coil of wire. So basically, the magnet is move, moving next to the wire, which generates a current. The current is bigger with the faster the movement. The current is alternating, and this is what I haven't discussed. Is a direct current goes in one direction, but because that magnet kept going up and down, that's an alternating current. The current is zero when the magnet is not moving. So here, at any point here and there, the actual ball wasn't bopping up and down, it was completely still, so there was no current induced. Yeah, And then it just talks about some different parts of the graph and what's actually occurring. But something that people really struggle with, but actually it's not too bad once you understand the basics of what an induced current is. So we've learned about an induced current and how we make an induced current. Yeah, And then that's how, in a power station, the, um, the electricity is generated because it moves the turbine and the electricity is sent all around the, the planet. So then where does it go? It goes to a transformer. Now remember, just after a power station, I'll just draw a power station for you as well. So my power station. Just after a power station, the first one you get is a step up transformer. Yeah, that makes the voltage increase. Voltage goes up. Why does it need to do that? Because it's going to go along power lines. Why does the voltage need to be so high, so high in, in power lines? Because that reduces current, which then means less heat loss. Yeah? Now, when it gets back to your town, to your nearby areas, it's going to have another transformer. This one is now going to be a step down because you want to take the voltage down. Why do you want to take the voltage down? Just to simply to make it safer. Yeah. Now, so we know how the electricity is generated in a power station. We should get how it's then induced. We should have an understanding of how the electricity is transferred all around the globe. Now, let's go back to right at the beginning. How can, what, where do we get the energy from to generate this electricity? Now, you could get asked about this, and actually it's, it's probably one of the easiest things, is renewable and non-renewable energy sources. So, renewable ones are the ones you can use over and over again. Non-renewable ones are obviously the opposite, which are eventually going to run out. Soul, wind, tidal, wave, geothermal, hydroelectric. I'm not going to go through these, because actually they're really straightforward. But... Just be careful because you could get a big question on this which asks you to discuss the similarities or differences, the disadvantages or advantages of each. The table shows them all. So have a look. Make sure you understand each one. If you don't get it, watch a little video on what solar or geothermal is. They're all renewable. Here are our non-renewable ones, coal, oil and gas. And obviously people, the obvious disadvantages is that it will run out and they give off... Um, fumes such as carbon dioxide yeah but spend a bit of time make sure you understand them because it could be easy marks lost if you don't look at it the universe that's our observable universe wouldn't worry about what these things are let's go zoom in so the universe is the is what we are all part of and it's the it's the biggest thing the biggest thing you're going to get is the universe Let's go zoom in. Now what we see is these things are galaxies. That's a galaxy there, the galaxy there. There's, there are literally billions of galaxies. This one here we're about to zoom into is our galaxy. The Milky Way. Now our Milky Way galaxy will have thousands of stars. If not thousands, millions and billions of stars. 
Now, I'm going to keep going. That was one bunch of stars just there. Let's go back. So I'm going along. That there, that's one of the, that's a star in our, in our galaxy. It's one of millions, if not billions of stars in our galaxy. Let's get, let's get closer and closer in. Oh, I went past something there. Keep going. Let's go back. Oh, that was the moon, which I just missed. And here is us. Now you need to understand. In fact, let's keep going. Let's just get closer and closer in. So we've got our planet going to a plant and you know what should be coming up next. What are plants made out of? Cells. Closer and closer and closer in. There's DNA. Then things do get even smaller. We have atoms. Then it even gets even freakier. But let's not worry about that. Now, why did I show you that? I show you that because you need to have an understanding of size and size. So, the universe is the biggest thing. Our next thing, which is going to be, which is going to be and if we zoomed in closer, is going to be galaxies. Galaxies contain millions and billions of stars then we've got stars so we've got universe galaxy star and then we get closer in we have planets and then we have moons you need to understand how size works and what's smallest and what are the biggest things so please do have an idea of that okay let's start off with the solar system the two models you got to learn one is called the geocentric model one is called the heliocentric model Geocentric is Earth-centered. Geocentric. Earth-centered. This is the one where we originally thought that the Earth was at the middle of everything. And they could ask you, why, why do people used to think this? So why would anyone think that the Earth is in the center of everything? Because if you look at the sky, what happens is, if I looked at any point in the sky, I would see that things would be moving around and the sun would move. The different stars would look like they were moving. So you would automatically assume that we are in the centre and everything is moving around us. So everything seems to move to move around us. And it makes sense. Scientists back in the day would have looked up and they would have seen the sun, moon, the uh, different stars moved and it would have logically you would have thought that the earth was in the center however this changed to later called the heliocentric model now this at first was very much opposed because it went against religious ideas of us being in the center of everything god created us so we are in the center of everything and everything goes around us so originally it wasn't accepted who got the evidence for it galileo he used a telescope to prove the heliocentric model was the correct model and how did he prove that he proved that because he looked at jupiter and he saw that jupiter had moons orbiting it what did that prove that not everything not everything orbits earth that was the first major piece of evidence to disprove the geocentric model. And nowadays we know the heliocentric model is the correct one. Know both. Okay. Now, you often get asked about telescopes. And a lot of the time, it's not necessarily how the telescope works. It's just more about what are the good things about using a telescope. Why are telescopes useful? Telescopes provide greater magnification. Yeah, they magnify. They zoom things in. They allow for continuous images. So you can make... Loads of it, so you can basically see everything at any time. Photographs provide a picture from one moment in time, so you can take a snapshot and you can keep that. Photographs can be studied. When you take a picture, you can study it later. Um, you need a way to capture telescope images to preserve them. It allows you to basically um, make a copy of them. So make sure you understand the benefits of using telescopes and the benefits of taking photographs. Okay, reflecting and refracting telescopes. Now, these look really complicated. All you need to remember is, is that both of them have lenses. The refracting telescope has two lenses, one there, one there, whilst the reflecting one has just a one lens. And a reflecting lens, a re refracting telescope, sorry, has mirrors. One refracts, one reflects. This is what they ask you all the time. What's the job of an eyepiece lens? 
So the light goes into here, it's collected, images form there, and then this thing here, the eyepiece lens, magnifies. Otherwise it'd be too small to see. A reflecting telescope also has an eyepiece lens. And then finally, what else do you get asked is, what is the job of an objective lens? Only found in refracting telescopes, and it basically collects the light. So the light comes in and it focuses the light at a point. So telescopes seem complicated, but just remember, you've got reflecting ones, you've got refracting ones. Both use lenses. However, a reflecting one also has mirrors. And then what to learn about lenses. Again, you often get little diagrams which ask you to like label the focal length. Remember, the focal length is the distance from the lens to the focal point. And this is cru crucial here. How can you find the focal length? Is by making an image on a screen and then measuring the distance. So you take a lens. So I take a lens. That's terrible. Let's do that again. You'd take a lens. There's my screen. I'd move it back and forth until I got a clear image. That would be my focal length from the lens to where the image is produced. Okay, explain the purpose of the eyepiece lens is your first question. The second question is, Galileo drew pictures of his observations of Jupiter. Nowadays we can take photo photo photographs, suggest how photographs would have helped Galileo. So we'll start with this one first. Explain the purpose of an eyepiece lens. It magnifies the image. And then why is that useful? Big enough to be seen clearly. Yeah, because they're asking to explain. So just by magnifying, you're giving me a description, but then why is magnifying useful? Because it's big enough to be seen clearly. Galileo drew pictures of his observations of Jupiter. Nowadays we can take photographs, suggest how photographs would have helped Galileo. But what's the one benefit of photographs? The one major benefit. The major benefit is, is you can keep photos. So photos provide a permanent record. So here's the um, mark scheme again. Magnify to provide greater deal. Images from the objective lens enlarges. Um, here results more results are more convincing to people. That's an interesting one. Is that the results would, if you'd shown people photographs, they would have more likely believed his ideas. And a photograph is also to scale. So there's a couple of different things you could have said. Galileo's observations of the moons of Jupiter disproved the geocentric model. However, their observations were not enough to prove the heliocentric model of the solar system. Explain how Galileo's observations disproved one model, but were not enough to prove the other model. Okay. So, six mark question. You can just bullet point. Now, the first thing you want to do is basically give a description of both models. So, the geocentric model suggests the earth was in the center therefore everything orbited the earth Now, what about the heliocentric model? The heliocentric model model suggests the sun is in the center of the solar system. Therefore, everything orbits the sun. Yeah? Now, explain why Galileo's observation disproved one model, but were not enough to prove the other model. So, so he disproved the geocentric model. And how did he do that? 
He do that by Galileo absorbed, absorbed, observed, Galileo observed moons orbiting Jupiter. This proved that not everything everything orbited the earth easy peasy now that's probably going to get you four or five marks but let's have a look at how we can get a few more so we said we described the two models Description of one set of observations. Explain how the observations contradict the geocentric model. Again, we've done that as well. So you may have actually got most of the marks in that. And you see that actually in a six mark question, you don't need to write that much. So let's look at the uh, more detailed mark scheme. The geocentric model said that everything up to the Earth, while the heliocentric model said everything up to the Sun. Galileo's observations that Jupiter had, had moons orbiting it showed that not everything went around the Sun. So yeah, exactly. That's pretty much it. So for a six mark question, you don't actually need to write that much. Just describe both models and then explain Galileo's work. A Doppler effect and redshift. So first, before I talk about either of them two, I want to first talk about the two theories of the universe. One is one you've all heard about, the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Now, what does this theory suggest? That everything... started from a single point and that the universe is expanding yeah no new matter has been made another new thing another important thing sorry no new matter made so in the Big Bang Theory, everything started from a tiny little point, and ever since then it's just been expanding and expanding and expanding. No new matter has ever been made. Steady state theory suggests that new matter is being made is made and again very similar to Big Bang, it also suggests the universe is expanding. So new natural is made and the universe is expanding. Now what is the evidence for both of those different um, theories? Now before you discuss that, let's talk about Doppler effect first. Because Doppler effect, let's, in fact, let's prove first of all, I'm going to prove to you the universe is expanding. Yeah, we're going to prove that to you first. How do we do that? So to understand that, let's think about something that you've probably seen in your life at some point or another. Seen or at least heard. So imagine if this is me, yeah, chilling, watching um, Formula One, yeah? So there's a racetrack, watching Formula One, okay? As the race car comes towards me, this car is absolutely amazing. As the racing car comes towards me, yeah? In fact, before it, as it comes towards me, as it goes past me, what sort of noise do I hear? I hear, meow, is what I hear. Yeah, now why does the, does the engine actually make a meow sound as it's going past you? No, but the engine is giving off a sound. So as the car is coming towards me, the sound waves get more and more bunched up. As it comes towards me, that makes the sound appear higher, higher pitch. And if you want to be a bit more scientific about this, what happens as the, as the object is coming towards you, the wavelength gets smaller. Yeah, wavelength gets smaller and the frequency gets higher. That's why you get that new bit, the high bit at the beginning. Now, as the car goes past me, so we'll draw another awesome car. Oh, this is a Formula One car, that's why it looks different to normal cars. 
as it goes away from me, what happens then? Is the waves start to spread out. So, new, that's the low bit. Because what happens to the waves? The waves now, the sound is lower because the wavelength, wave length gets longer. Yeah? Therefore, frequency gets higher. Now that's the Doppler effect. That okay, now what has that got to do with the universe? Well, a similar thing happens with light. So, if... Um, let's change the colour a second. So we've got a person here. Yeah, and I'm going to draw um, some stars. We'll use a yellow colour. Now it's very bright, but it doesn't matter. So that's a star here, and I've got another star here. Now, if this star was moving towards a person, stars, you know, give off light in the form of waves. If a star was moving towards a person, what would happen is, is the light, the waves, would get squashed. Think about it. If the light's coming towards you, the wave will get squashed just like with the sound before. That's called blue shift. There'll be shift towards a blue end of the spectrum. We don't see that. We see that actually what's happening is, is something slightly different in that the waves are getting spread out. And that's called red shift, which then proves... That the stars are moving away from us. Which then also proves what? That the universe is expanding. Yeah, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We don't see this. We do see this. So, again, remember, be very specific about your science. In redshift, what's happening? Is you have a longer wavelength. Longer wavelength. Which also means a lower frequency and the blue shift will be the opposite smaller wavelength and a higher frequency yeah that's what we see so we know the universe is expanding but this is evidence for both R big bang and steady state what's the only piece of evidence for the big bang theory is all you got to remember is something called c m b cosmic microwave background radiation and all it is is the left over radiation from the Big Bang. Leftover radiation from the Big Bang. That proves Big Bang. So redshift proves both. CMB is the piece of evidence to prove only the Big Bang theory. Okay, let's try a question. The diagram shows some lines in a spectrum of light from a nearby galaxy. One of the lines is mark X. Line X will be in a different position in the spectrum of light from a much more distant galaxy. Draw a line on the diagram to show the possible new position for line X in the spectrum of light. Now, to understand this, you need to understand that the things that are further away from us are moving, the fast, are moving faster. So they show greater redshift. What does redshift mean? It just means that these lines shift towards the red end of the spectrum so what would be my new line my new line would be just anywhere here anywhere to this side so what redshift actually means is those the spectral lines move towards the red end explain why you were drawing line line y in this position why are we drawing it in that position is because the galaxies uh, the further they are, the faster they are moving, and therefore greater red shift. But let's have a look. Distant galaxies moving away, line shifted longer. It's because they are moving away faster. Yeah, so that's there. Same thing there. So another important point to remember is the universe is expanding, but the things that are further away are actually moving the fastest. Edwin Hubble discovered the universe was expanding. He did this by using observations of redshift. Explain what redshift is and how it provides evidence the universe is expanding. Okay.
Now, what sort of things would you write? What do we know about redshift? Yeah, so remember, bullet point it. So what is redshift? In fact, rather than me writing this, I'll show you the points. Light shifted to the red and spectrum. One bullet point. Light waves are stretched, so the wavelength increases. Yeah, we discussed that. Light, light shifted to the red end of the spectrum. Light waves are stretched, so the wave becomes longer. Yeah? The spectral lines move to the red end. That's a little bit harder. People struggle to understand that. But for the moment, if that's just a one, that's one point, it's not going to kill you. The frequency of the wave changes. The frequency is less. Redshift shows galaxies are moving away from us. Greater redshift indicates galaxies are moving away further. Further away galaxies have greater redshift. Now, there's so many points you can mention. You even get a, a mark for mentioning a little bit about Doppler effect. But you don't need all of them. But in an exam, you better be safe than sorry and write all the points you can think of. As long as you don't contradict yourself, you will not lose any marks. Okay, stars. Now, stars are one of the coolest things ever. Now, where do stars Form. They form in things called nebula. So nebula. You start with a nebula. Yeah? And all a nebula is, is just gas and dust. Yeah? And these are the things that look really, really pretty. And I actually got quite a few of those pictures in my room. So gas and dust is where you find, or in a nebula, is where stars are formed. Now, how does a star begin to form? Because the mass... compresses so what does that mean it just means that the dust and the gas start to come together they start to come gather up and gather up now if, if you if you understand this that actually as they start to as it starts to gather up and become larger the bigger it is the more gravity it is and then more stuff starts to build up and eventually you get something called a proto star so basically just a baby star, yeah. So a star which has just f formed. Now, if you want to be more specific, this star has just before just formed, which means the hydrogen nuclei fuse. Hydrogen nuclei fuse. Fusion is what happens in stars. Now, what will happen is the star will enter. Its main period of its life, which we call a main sequence stage. This is where our star is now. In its main part of its life, in its prime. Okay, now, what happens now? This is interesting now. You either got, well, you either got a cool way or you got a boring way. We'll start with boring way first. This is what our star will do. Our star will eventually become a red giant. This is basically when most of, of the hydrogen has fused. So most of it. Yeah? Red giant, most of the hydrogen is fused, and the star basically, the inner red giant, it just expands, yeah? The outer layers. So the outer layers expand, and it gets really, really large. Now, what will happen eventually is, is eventually our star will become something called a white dwarf. So basically, when it expanded... That shell of gas that was around it just sort of dissipates. Gas shell thrown out. Yeah, that should say thrown. So the gas shell is gone and all you're left with is the, the core of the star. And then that will then stay like that for a long, long time and eventually become something called a black dwarf. However... There are no black dwarfs in the universe. is because the universe has not been around for long enough. That's what our star will do. Main sequence, red giant, white dwarf, and black dwarf. Now, this happens for stars that are similar to our size. Now, much bigger stars do something more interesting. They become red. Red 
super giants yeah now these are stars that are generally a lot hotter and they actually live a smaller life it's smaller a shorter life they basically live fast yeah they don't these ones are die calmly and most of their life is relatively calm these ones are really really hot burn fast do loads of fusion fast 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 eventually they become red super giants now what will happen to a red super giant eventually it will supernova the brightest most energetic explosions in the universe yeah so basically the outer layers expand and it contracts in but you don't need to know the detail just remember a supernova is basically when a red super giant kind of explodes yeah where the gravity is no longer strong enough to hold the layers together yeah okay now now you've got two things you can either become a neutron star or a black hole you don't need to know details black hole is just well how can i really explain a black hole black hole is just something that has immense gravity you don't need to know anything more than that so something that's massive massive will become a black hole something that's still big will become a neutron star so our path is this one cool massive stars do this path but really really remember some of the key things like um hydrogen nuclei fusing in fact here i also want to add here is that how do you get how do the initial star form the mass compressors because of heat and then the kinetic oh, it's not coming up properly which means more kinetic energy because what you want to happen is you want the star to fuse so all the gas and dust is moving around eventually it gets bigger and bigger and bigger starts to fuse and you get a proto star then a main sequence star that's how stars are formed and i think i have a little diagram here as well remember this is in the um knowledge powerpoint so do have a look average stars massive stars okay let's try a question 6a um a long time ago scientists thought the universe never changed now there's evidence to show that the stars progress through various stages and that the universe is expanding our sun is in its main sequence stage a star much greater mass than our sun will eventually become so a star with a much greater mass and we said there's two choices neutron star or black hole but they haven't included the neutron star in there so it must be a black hole yeah protostar is baby star a red dwarf we don't even know what that is and a white dwarf is what happens to ours eventually describe how the sun reached its main sequence stage okay so where does it form first in a nebula yeah it happens in a nebula particles come together yeah gravity increases heat and pressure increase and then finally that causes fusion which results in a proto star yeah and that will then turn into a main sequence star main sequence star okay scientists can estimate the age of a star they want to find the age of the oldest star suggest why knowing the age of the oldest star is not enough to tell scientists the age of the universe that's a tricky question yeah suggest why knowing the age of the i uh, know the age of the oldest star is not enough to tell scientists the age of the universe have a go yourself if you want but let's show you the mark scheme the oldest star has not yet appeared now that's weird how do you mean the oldest star has never appeared well think of it like this the universe is so gigantic yeah it's massive it's so big that if this is me here on earth the light from the furthest stars the furthest stars are so far away that it takes 
billions of years for the light to even get to me. And some of the light from the furthest, furthest reaches of the universe have actually never got to us. So some of that light has never reached us. And I know that sounds very weird, but actually when you look into the sky, you're actually looking into the past because the light took so long to get to us. The universe is older than the older star, and that's an easy, easy mark. The universe itself was born, well, born, created, appeared before the oldest star ever took form, yeah? Another mark is stars take time to form, and they give you another mark for saying that you can't be certain of this time. You just don't know how long it takes each star to form.